very lovely interactive meeting. I've been asked to talk about retrieval techniques, and this is very important uh, for a number of uh, situations, particularly devices like ASDs, VSDs, and so on. Um, sometimes embolized stents, uh, and there are different ways of dealing with this. Uh, many a time it's a bailout situation. We get asked to remove uh, bits of lines which uh, have either been broken, uh, broviac long lines, hemodialysis catheters, and sometimes the anesthetists, when they are putting in uh, wires into the um, central uh, um, approach, because they're not as used to uh, the Seldinger technique as we are, sometimes I've, I've had to pick up wires from the circulation. There are sometimes ruptured balloons, as I indicated this morning, and uh, obviously we also have to deal with things like pacing uh, leads. So there are a lot of uh, retrieval things that we have to do. Um, in terms of uh, how you find out, for devices, particularly when we're uh, dealing with chance, either the patients have symptoms. If there's ectopy on the monitor, uh, don't ignore it. It may well be an uh, embolized device. Again, if there's, the, if there's a residual large shunt, think where the device is. It may have actually moved, particularly if you can't see the device, and if they have any neurological or systemic symptoms. As far as the devices, there are numerous, and I think it's important to familiarize yourself with a number of them. Um, the commonest by far is the gooseneck and the entrio uh, snares, but there are a lot of others as well. Um, if you have no uh, devices on the shelf at the time, uh, and particularly if you need to cover something quite large, <coughs> using a long coronary wire is, is very helpful. So you use a 260 long wire, you bend it at the center, and you put it through a, a guide catheter, and that can act as a very, very, very good snare. Uh, the cook retrieval forceps is very, very good and strong. There are biotome type uh, devices. The biotome is, first of all, it doesn't have a big bite, and it's not very, very strong. So you can catch something and then not be able to, uh, uh, not be able to, to keep it. Unlike the cook retrieval forceps, which once you grab it, it, can't, it won't let go. But there is a, a, a biopsy type um, device, the Maslanka device, which is marketed by PFM, which is really very, uh, it's, it's an industrial heavy biopsy forceps. And of course, the Domia basket. So this is what they would look like. There's the Entrio, that's the gooseneck, those are the commonest ones. This is the Maslanka uh, biopsy forceps, and that's the cook retrieval forceps. Those are by far the commonest ones that uh, we tend to use. Uh, in terms of sheets, very, very important to have uh, ideally braided sheets, the bigger the better, uh, because uh, you, know, you, you, don't, you want to get the device inside and you don't want to cause trauma to the surrounding tissues, so use the, the, the biggest one that you uh, have. And uh, the mullins uh, is a little bit of a problem because it's not braided and therefore it can kink, and it forms like a concertina if you uh, don't have a very large one. There are some basic principles we have to adhere to. Um, we use the largest sheet possible. Anticoagulation, very important because these sheets, uh, even if you have flow going through them, and uh, they can clot. Uh, biplane, ideally, especially if you have something lost in the pulmonary artery, um, you need to uh, make sure that the device is uh, secure. In other words, if it embolizes on the cath lab table, if you know that it's in a safe place, do something to try and keep it there. Avoid it from embolizing further. When you're retrieving devices, avoid crossing valves, except uh, with the device within the sheath, and uh, think about uh, bailout uh, situations, especially with stents, uh, but sometimes even with devices. And occasionally, you may have to think about surgery or hybrid. So have all the options open. There are complications. Undoubtedly, damage to the vessels is, an, is, is one thing, as well as to the valves. Because of the large sheaths, clots, and emboli, um, we need to uh, consider um, Perforation, uh, either into the uh, pulmonary artery, aorta, or the heart causing tamponade, because you're really manipulating uh, very stiff uh, wires and sheets. Uh, infection, so take care and, and treat this as, uh, as, as an operation procedure. And uh, <coughs> undoubtedly, uh, some, people can, some patients can die as a result. But even if you're looking after the sheath very well, you can still get clots like this. So make sure the patients are well anticoagulated and so on. Um, this is a series of uh, um, uh, pictures showing uh, retrieval of an embolized uh, Starflex device. This is no longer available, but for soft devices, you can pretty much grab them from anywhere. 
and, uh, and you can uh, retrieve them uh, into a sheet without any problems. The stiffer devices like the Amplatza devices, this is an ASD device which is embolized into the pulmonary artery, right pulmonary artery. It's very important to try and catch it by the screw end and once you've done that, pull it into a big sheet and then retrieve it into the sheet. It's safe to do so like that. What is not recommended is to do uh, is to use this situation. So you have a, again an ASO device caught um, in the um, uh, in the pulmonary artery. But as you can see, a lot of uh, pull is being applied. The sheet is actually tearing and the side, as you can see there, the device is then pulled through the tricuspid valve and uh, eventually is pulled through. No major problems happened with this one, but I wouldn't recommend that you do this. I shan't mention who gave me those slides. Um, what I prefer is to do something like this. Uh, so in other words, the sheet is pulled uh, uh, back. If you can't get the device within the sheet, is to pull the sheet back. Um, you can then create a, a, a loop, uh, like you can see in the third uh, slide there, to try and get it to go on its own through the tricuspid valve. And once it's in the right atrium, then you can actually do whatever you need to do to pull it out. If the sheet is not big enough, you can use a bailout sheet um, so to, you can upsize it. Uh, the alternative is to use something like this where you go from the top, you catch the two ends of the uh, device, you straighten it to make it slimmer, um, and then uh, um, you can uh, uh, pull it into the uh, sheet like so. And the advantage of this is uh, sometimes you can actually grasp the screw uh, 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 perpendicular rather than, uh, sorry, in parallel rather than at right angles. Because if you catch it like this, um, you may have problems getting it into the sheath. Um, um, so what you can do, you can actually do a bevel on the sheath here uh, uh, so that you can get the whole thing inside or use a big sheath uh, instead. Uh, this is a patient who uh, had a natal septal defect. It looked, for all intents and purposes, a very straightforward ASD. Uh, you can see it on the first one. It deployed very nicely with tissue inside, but uh, soon afterwards it embolized into the left atrium. Uh, the first thing to do is to secure it. It was very close to the left atrial appendage, so what I did is I placed a, um, uh, I placed a sheath uh, or, uh, uh, over there to stop it from moving eventually caught the um, screw end with a small entryo snare, but unfortunately um, the uh, entryo snare broke. Uh, so you can see there's the tip of the entryo snare there, but the cable is gone completely, but at least we have the screw within the uh, sheath. So what I did is I used a very small snare to remove this out, save it from getting embolized. I then had the screw within the uh, sheath, grasped it and pulled it out. Uh, so like that, you don't, you're really parallel rather than perpendicular. Um, this is a patient with a couple of uh, um, defects and a couple of uh, ASD devices. Uh, with hindsight, um, probably um, there was not enough space for the two devices, and what happened is as these two were rubbing together, they tore the uh, atrial uh, septum between the two, and uh, um, uh, the uh, device is embolized. So I was contacted, and I was asked, the, the two devices embolized into the pulmonary artery, patient is very stable, can we do this tomorrow? And I said, yeah, well, that's fine. Make sure that the patient is anticoagulated and so on. When I went in on the following day, clearly this was not moving. It, it also wasn't uh, round. It had a straight border. So this was clearly in the aorta. This we were not sure where it was, uh, but as it happened, it was also in the aorta. So we removed one of them uh, to start with. We tried to go for the next one, and it uh, went into the left ventricle. Um, the assistant uh, who was with me is a, a lady who's married to a cardiac surgeon. Whenever there is a problem, she runs away and she rings her husband, uh, which I find very irritating. So I, she did that, and I said, you know, can you come here? This is where I need you. Uh, so uh, she came over, and we managed to, um, uh, uh, to, to remove the device, resized it, and put one device into one big hole, and she's done extremely well. VSD devices can also embolize. This is a patient who had a permembranous VSD device, went home, two days later complained of very brief but sharp abdominal pain. 
Uh, I did not think it was anything, but you know, I said, come, let's have a look at you. There was a shunt, I couldn't see the device. I did a, a, an x-ray, and clearly the device had gone into the um, uh, abdominal aorta. Again, you go onto the screw side, make sure you have a big enough sheet. Fortunately, the patient was old enough to have a big sheath, and you can then uh, retrieve that uh, very well uh, into the sheath, uh, and then we've placed uh, a second, uh, slightly bigger device uh, without any problems. Um, this is a patient with a paramembranous VST with uh, an aneurysm. Uh, my advice here was not to use a paramembranous uh, device, but because of the aneurysm, to actually use something very different. But I was proctoring at the time, and the person said, oh, we, you know, we, you've come to show us how to use the paramembranous VSD device, and we haven't done one yet. So, you know, it was the wrong decision to, uh, uh, to fall for that, because obviously the right-sided disc did not open very well. Um, so it embolized into the aorta, and again, uh, we could easily... Um, um, retrieved that and replaced it with a more appropriate device, which is the muscular VSD device. Uh, this is a patient, who, again, with a paramembranous VSD. Uh, it looked uh, okay, but uh, on the angiogram, I was unhappy because the two discs clearly were both on the left side, even though the device was stable and the shunt was much smaller. Tried to retrieve it, and as soon as I had the snare very close to it, it embolized into the aorta, which confirms that it wasn't stable enough. And again, um, we were able to go through the VSD. Uh, again, with a big sheath, it's better to go through the venous side. There's no conduction problems, and we were able to retrieve this uh, without any problems. This is a patient with a post infarct VSD, uh, in a triotic balloon pump, VSD there. Uh, very uh, suitable for uh, catheter closure. Placed a device there with the DELV angiograms. Uh, also did an RV angiogram to make sure it's, we're on the, uh, you know, it's covering the, the whole area was rather stretched, so it was rather tunnel-like um, uh, lesion. Um, but um, unfortunately, uh, once we released it, it embolized into the left ventricle. Uh, this is where we used a coronary wire. <coughs> so um, you, you bend the coronary wire halfway, um, and, and uh, you use it as a snare. And you can see that uh, we pulled it um, through the aortic valve, and then eventually uh, into, into the uh, uh, sheath, brought it down to the femoral side, and uh, placed the, uh, 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 the device um, into the ventricle again. Um, the the uh, device that can be a bit difficult to retrieve is the uh, ADO1, because the screw is actually recessed. Um, um, so many of these times you have to try and grab it uh, with a, a snare around here, and then get it back into um, a sheath. This is a patient with an aortic pyrovalvular leak where I put in uh, an ADO1, uh, and the result looked very good. Uh, one of the uh, trainees said to me, can you show me how to do the TOE to look at the pulmonary veins and so on? So whilst I was doing that, I realized that there was still a big shunt when there wasn't before we, um, we took the sheets out. And uh, what happened is, uh, as you can see here, the device embolized. This is a mechanical aortic valve, and we're going through the paravalvular leak with a, with a snare. Uh, eventually, we managed to catch it. Remember that what you see is not instantaneous. You're a fraction of a second behind. So if you think you're catching it at this point, the device may well be somewhere else. So this is not skill. This is luck, but persistence as well. And uh, we then place the muscular uh, device there with a good result. Um, this is a patient with uh, atrial fibrillation who had uh, a left atrial appendage device. For all, for all intents and purposes, it's perfect. There's compression, there's separation of the discs, and there's concavity of the, uh, of the disc as well. So, and the angiogram doesn't show any paravalvular leak, uh, para, para ACP leak at all. all. All the contrast is going through the device. Um, nevertheless, the device embolized, and you can see it's very, very close to the aortic valve. The problem with this device is that it's got um, barbs or hooks which attach it to the left atrial wall. So we're very concerned about the aortic valve. But nevertheless, we played around with a pigtail catheter, brought it down into the aorta, and caught it, and then brought it down uh, to the femoral uh, uh, and iliac uh, uh, vein. As I mentioned this morning, sometimes when you do angioplasty, um, um, you can get um, um, rupture of the balloon if it's longitudinal, it's easy to take out. 
If it's transverse, many a time you finish up with contrast there, but nothing here. So if this is a, a sign that you may be dealing with rupture of the um, uh, balloon transversely. And I showed you this morning how we actually do it. Uh, you can actually also do the same if you're doing this from the jugular. But if you look at things, this is how it is. You've got part of the balloon here. You've got your multipurpose catheter. And as you push this and pull on that, you can actually extrude the distal part of the balloon. So that is a way of um, um, uh, creating the circuit and uh, removing a transversely ruptured balloon. Uh, this is a patient, who, uh, a premature baby, who had a number like artery uh, line for monitoring. And um, uh, when they uh, removed the umbilical artery line, the patient bled almost to death. There was a lot of bleeding from the umbilical site. Uh, and um, eventually it stopped, but uh, finished up with uh, necrotizing enterocolitis. So I did an abdominal x-ray, and they discovered that part of the line was actually left in the umbilical um, uh, uh, artery and the, and the femoral. So what happened is when they actually took the suture, they actually cut the um, uh, line and therefore had a direct communication between the aorta and the exterior, ex uh, and the outside. So that's why he bled a lot. Um, the surgeons were not keen to go in because of the NEC and prematurity and everything. So again, we went in, uh, initially dislodged it by pushing it up into the ascending aorta and then eventually pulled it out. Stents, these can actually embolize. Uh, this is a patient with transverse arch stenosis, having had previous uh, surgery. Um, and uh, uh, initially, I had my catheter in the ascending aorta, and I should have kept it there. Decided to put it into the uh, subclavian artery. There was not enough space for the balloon, and it really milked out and uh, uh, finished up into the uh, thoracic aorta. Um, I tried to put, push it back, but it's nearly uh, impossible to do that. So I bailed it out into, the, into a safe place in the thoracic aorta and then put the wire back in its place as it should be, opened it up appropriately there, and with a good result. But you can see that there is the bailed out of the stent at that point there. So that's a lesson I learned. I showed you this this morning. This is a displaced stent uh, in the context of a CP uh, shunt, uh, which we were able to retrieve. You can't retrieve all these stents. If you can't retrieve them, you bail out. But if there's something like an open cell valeo stent or something like that, you may be able to actually pull them out through a big sheet. Um, some of the things that we have to do in, uh, in, in terms of extraction is also pacemaker leads. And there are different indications, sometimes infections, sometimes uh, um, leads that are not working well. Um, most of the time, we use the telescopic uh, sheets, and that's usually uh, enough. But sometimes you have to combine uh, entry from the top, but also uh, from below using the so-called workstation and the thread needle and large sheets, sometimes even up to 16 French sheets. There, is a, there are different uh, uh, methods that you can uh, release the leads. You can use laser, you can use radio frequency, but uh, the more recent is the mechanical um, uh, removal of these sheets using a device like this. This is the evolution from Cook, but there is also the tie trail from Spectronetics. Both were the same. The difference is that the cook has the teeth on the outside, so if you want to remove one lead and there are several others, you may damage them, whereas the spectronetics has the teeth on the inside, which protects the wires. And as you can see, you work your way through until you get all the adhesions out. You keep your access into the heart, and then you replace them with new leads, obviously so long as the system is not infected. There was a time when to, for, uh, to paste children for, to allow for growth, they, uh, some operators were putting in a, uh, a loop in the IVC. This inevitably got stuck here, so it was a, a silly idea in many ways. And this was one that was referred to me from Newcastle. Uh, again, very, very, very stuck down here. We eventually um, uh, extracted it and replaced it with a new system. Uh, so that wasn't easy. It was very, very, very stuck. And you know, the hepatic veins are not, uh, or the IVC is not necessarily the thickest. But you can see what kind of tissue you can get with these. This is why they're very, very difficult to take out. Uh, in, in one case, the tip of the uh, um, screwing lead actually got uh, dis uh, disconnected from the rest of the pacing lead. This patient had Isomanger syndrome and finished up with uh, an embolized bit into the femoral artery, which I could retrieve from the contralateral side. 
very important to appreciate where the uh, pacing wires are. This, this is not actually in the right ventricle. It may appear so, but in fact it's gone through the PFO into the left side, and on echo you can see it going through the mitral valve. When you have something like this, do not take it out. Ask a surgeon to do so. It's much safer. So, in conclusion, uh, I think skills are, uh, and equipment are absolutely essential in any center where uh, interventions are being carried out. Uh, you can't just do procedures without uh, uh, re retrieval. Uh, I think it's important to take appropriate uh, precautions um, and to obtain support from colleagues and from, from a surgeon. I think retrieving unsheathed devices across the valves can cause damage, so you must not do that. And particularly, if you've got a stent, do not cross a, a valve uh, uh, with, with, a, with a, an open stent because they're sharp and they will damage valves. I think it's negligent to do so. Sometimes surgery is safer and occasionally a hybrid procedure may have to be considered. So if you have a stent in the aorta, instead of pulling it through the aortic valve, it's better to use a hybrid, pick it up um, uh, under radiological control and then the surgeon can take it out. And very rarely, I think it's best to leave embolized device alone. If you have a small coil that's embolized into the pulmonary artery you, and it's difficult to take out, you might as well leave it rather than uh, um, uh, risk damaging uh, uh, the, the lung, the, the pulmonary artery, or causing major bleeding. Thank you.